Organ Gallery. Today, John Lade talks to Nicholas Danby about the organ at St Mary's Church, Rotherhithe, in south-east London. And we shall also be hearing a record of music by Blow, Walland, Samuel Wesley and Boyce. Here now is John Lade to introduce the programme. This is the first time in Organ Gallery that I've visited a church in London. This one is not all that far from Broadcasting House. You just take the tube from Oxford Circus, get onto the district line as far as Whitechapel, and then take the tube again, which burrows under the river at Wapping, and comes up again in Rotherhithe. There, among the warehouses and docks, close to the river, you find this astonishingly beautiful church of St Mary. Everything seemed quite different from the rest of London, with a character and fascination that are all its own. Once inside the church, I found it, for me at any rate, dominated by its organ case, which stands in a gallery at the West End. I shall be talking about the organ in a minute or two to Nicholas Danby, who, though he normally plays at Farm Street Church in Mayfair, has made a record at Rotherhithe. First of all, I'd like you to hear the organ. Nicholas Danby is playing a typical 18th century English voluntary by William Walland, and we'll be talking about the sparrows that you can hear later on. <laughs> William Wallon's Voluntary in G, played by Nicholas Danby on the organ of St Mary's Church, Rotherhithe, which, as you heard, had a rather attractive accompaniment from the local sparrows. Well, when I arrived at the church, I was delighted to find there Noel Mander, the man who has restored this organ and prevented us from losing a valuable 18th century masterpiece. So, before we meet Nicholas Danby, I want you to hear from Noel Mander how he came to discover this organ. When I was quite a kid, as an apprentice, I was always wandering around churches, and I'd heard that this organ was to be amalgamated with the instrument from St. Olive's Church in Tudley Street, a building that was going to be pulled down. And directly I saw it, I knew that it would be a tragedy. Of course, I could do nothing to prevent it, but thank heaven, they hadn't got quite enough money to do it. And the St. Olive's organ was allowed to rot, and this one was preserved for restoration later on. And when did you come to restore it? In the 50s, I took care of it in the 50s, and then in 59, I think it was, I took it right down and most carefully restored it. Did you add anything to it? No, I didn't add anything, but I replaced pipes and stops that had been taken out over the years. I tried to put myself into Byfield shoes to do what he would have done if he had been here. It's very beautiful. Could you describe the case, do you think? Oh, the case is a superb Rococo case. Some people call it Baroque, but it isn't. It's a Rococo case, mid-18th century, of the very best period, very best design, and superb workmanship. When we came here, it was actually painted and grained to look like oak. We had to scrape all the paint off and get this original colour back. Well, that was Noel Amanda who restored this organ at Rotherhithe. I then said to Nicholas Danby that the church and the organ seemed to be so much part of one another that I thought we ought to hear something about the building itself. And I asked him first if the church hadn't some very interesting associations. Yes, indeed. The captain of the Mayflower is buried in the churchyard. But although the Mayflower sailed from Plymouth, it's generally supposed the crew came from Rotherhithe. And another interesting thing is that the communion table is made from the timbers of the Fighting Temeraire, which was a, a ship which took part in the Battle of Trafalgar. I see that the organ, which stands at the west end of the church, by the way, in a gallery, was built by subscription of some of the inhabitants of the parish, A.D. 1764, and that the builder was John Byfield. Which member of the famous family was he? He's John Byfield, Jr., and he'd built other organs, including those at Greenwich Hospital, uh, the Drury Lane Theatre, the Sheldonian Theatre in Oxford, and Christ Church Cathedral, Dublin. His father, John Byfield Sr., was married to the daughter of the famous organ builder, Renatus Harris, and he was in partnership with his son, John Harris. So it has a very splendid pedigree. Indeed. 
Could you first tell us something about the organ as it is now and how much of the original Byfield material still exists? A great deal of the original Byfield still exists. Russell added another open diapason on the grate in 1801, but he removed a four-foot nasen flute on the grate and also, unfortunately, the cornet. But a new cornet was made, however, by Noel Mander in his 1959 restoration. On the choir organ, everything is Byfield except the Cremona, which was also Russell's, which replaced the Vox Humana. Russell also added the swell division. In 1810, the old G manual compass to the great and choir was altered to the present normal compass, and the pedal board and 16 foot was added. In 1882, the old short compass swell was likewise altered. Yes, I think there's one thing we ought to get quite clear. Originally, the organ must have had two manuals. Yes. The third manual was added in 1801. That was the swell. That's right. Before we hear some of the music on your record, I believe when you were making it, you had a bit of trouble with sparrows. Oh, yes, we tried all manner of things to discourage them from chirping, including banging on the windows with broom handles. But nothing worked, so we let them sing on. You can just occasionally hear them on the record. And I think it adds something to the atmosphere, you know. Perhaps you'll let us hear one or two of the most interesting Byfield stops. I believe, for instance, that the trumpet on the grate is an especially fine one. Yes, it's marvellous, and I'll just demonstrate it uh, by playing a few bars of a Stanley trumpet voluntary. I'd also very much like to contrast the stop diapason on the grate with the stop diapason on the choir. They're both very beautiful stops, but each with their own particular characteristic. First of all, the stop diapason on the grate. the stop their basin on the choir. Now, one of the most beautiful sounds that I know, the stop diapason on the choir with the four foot flute. It's absolutely ravishing.
almost everything you've recorded is in the form of the voluntary. Now, in case anyone's afraid that we're going to hear a succession of those dreary improvisations in the key of E-flat, so beloved of composers of Victorian soft voluntaries, I believe they used to call them, could you define the very characteristic English 17th and 18th century voluntary? In the 17th century, the style of the voluntary, sometimes it was called a fancy or a fantasia, was really a continuation of the idiomatic keyboard idiom of the Tudors and Elizabethans, together with very often a highly elaborated system of ornamentation. But in the 18th century, as exemplified by such composers as Green, Stanley, Boyce, Walland, the voluntary was nearly always a two-movement composition, comprising a slow movement, directed to be played on the diapasons, and a quick movement, more often than not in two parts, designed to show off some of the solo stops, for instance, the trumpet or the cornet. But first, a voluntary for the cornet stop by Purcell's teacher, John Blow. Is the cornet stop here like the ones Blow would have had in mind? It's difficult to say, but uh, I think so. The cornet here, however, although an excellent one, and it's got great character, is new, and replaces one that was removed by Russell in 1801. So that it's a reproduction? It's a reproduction, yes. Voluntary for the Cornet Stop by John Blow. And now another voluntary. This one is in D minor by William Walland, the Oxford composer who died in 1770. Does this follow the same plan as most 18th century voluntaries? Yes, except that the introductory movement is far longer than was usual and employs the use of three manuals. Massive chordal progressions are designated to the great organ and these are alternated with very beautiful recitative passages directed to be played on the swell accompanied by the choir organ. The ensuing quick movement is mostly in three parts in fugato style marked a tempo ordinario. No registration is marked by the composer. <laughs> voluntary in D minor. As a change from the voluntary, let's move to a rather later period for the well-known Air and Gavotte by Samuel Wesley, who died in 1837, the year Queen Victoria came to the throne. He was something of an eccentric. One dictionary description I always like, it says that he injured his head in an accident with the result that he periodically fell into strange behavior for the rest of his life. There's something strange, isn't there, about the collection of pieces that included the two we're to hear in a moment. Yes, and the collection is entitled 12 short pieces. In fact, there are 13. Uh, just before we hear the Ehrengwatt, do you know who supplied these titles? Because, so far as I remember, Wesley just numbered them. Yes, you're quite right. I, it's difficult to say, but I think probably uh, the famous 19th century arranger of early English organ music, John E. West, who arranged a lot of music for the modern organ as he knew it. With pedals, with I pedals, suppose. With pedals. Because the original pieces had no pedals. Invariably, yes. Mm. yes. Samuel Wesley's Air and Gavotte. Well, let's end with another voluntary, a very typical one in D by William Boyce. How do you register this one? The slow movement I register traditionally on the diapasons. And this incidentally means using both the open diapason and the stop diapason drawn together. And the quick movement I register on the very fine Byfield trumpet on the grate, which I've already demonstrated. 
Some of the pipes are slightly slower in speech, unfortunately, which accounts for some vagaries in rhythm, but it's not the inadequacy of my fingers. William Boyce's Voluntary in D was played by Nicholas Danby on the organ of St Mary's Church, Rotherhithe. You also heard Nicholas Danby and Noel Lander in conversation with John Laid, who produced the programme.